Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tuesday Tune. Back for another season of uh, talking tech about bikes, nerding out a bit. Uh, today, I wanted to uh, discuss some aspects of bike geometry and handling. Uh, this is not all strictly suspension related, but you'll see uh, how that ties in pretty shortly. So this week uh, is part one of two videos that we're doing on uh, bike geometry and handling. There's a couple of things that we're going to discuss this week and some more things that we'll discuss next week. Um, obviously, bike geometry is extremely important in terms of how much you like riding a bike. It really has a huge effect on the handling. Uh, well, the only effect on the handling other than the weight, I suppose. So let's uh, dive into a couple of concepts that are not necessarily commonly discussed. Uh, and I'll explain why they are particularly relevant uh, and might be useful for you next time you are looking into buying a bike. So what we have sketched out here uh, is a very rudimentary model of bike geometry. Uh, we have the head angle shown, surprisingly not all that important in my opinion. Uh, not completely unimportant, but not as critical as uh, various other aspects. We have rear wheel, front wheel, rear center, basically the horizontal distance from the bottom bracket to the rear axle, front center, horizontal distance from the bottom bracket to the front axle, and your wheelbase is the sum of the two. So your wheelbase is from here to here. Your center of mass is usually positioned roughly above the bottom bracket. It can be a little bit further back uh, if you are seated and climbing. It can be a bit further forward if you're weighting the front heavily um, when cornering, for example. What we have here is reach and stack. So reach and stack are well documented as being pretty major parts of a bike's fit. So what they really determine is how far away your bottom bracket is from your handlebars when you're standing. What they don't tell you is your top tube length, which is the distance effectively uh, from your handlebars to your seat. So that determines how stretched out you feel uh, when you are sitting down. What the reach and the stack really give us in combination is what I call spread. So spread is the distance directly between uh, your bottom bracket and your handlebars. And so this is what really determines how big a bike feels. So how spread out you are between your hands and your feet. Uh, I think trying to account for only reach or only stack on its own doesn't give you a good idea of bike fit. So the reason that this is important, um, we will explain shortly. So with respect to mountain bike handling, uh, there are three primary scenarios that I like to consider. So we have our front end limit case scenario where all your weight is on the front wheel, no weight on the rear wheel. We have the rear end limit case scenario, which is all your weight on the rear wheel, like you're pulling a wheelie while you're climbing. Uh, and then we have the transient scenario, uh, which is where we're concerned with the weight distribution between the wheels at a given moment. It's most applicable to things like grip when you're cornering, playfulness of the bike and things along those lines. Grip is really the big one though. Uh, a lot of other aspects we can look at one end or the other. So let's dive into what aspects of geometry affect that. As you may have noticed, I've drawn a couple of angles uh, from the center of mass to the front and the rear contact patch. So we have alpha and beta. So alpha is what I call our endo angle and beta is our looping angle. What these essentially refer to is um, what kind of angle the bike can get up to either over the front wheel or over the rear wheel before you are past your tipping point. Obviously with mountain bikes, uh, we tend to have a rearward weight bias. And this is something else I'll get into shortly. Uh, part of the reason for this is that nearly all the things that are sudden accelerations, uh, violent, strong accelerations are braking or bumps, uh, big compressions, anything like that. They all tend to throw us forwards, not so much backwards. So as a result, right of center of mass tends to be rear of center. If we were to look at uh, you know, the distance between front and rear axles, we're not square in the center here, we're a little bit back. What you might be able to work out from here is that if we increase the rear center or the front center, we make these angles shallower. As these angles get shallower, it essentially means that we need a steeper angle, uh, either climbing or going over the front, uh, to tip us over. This is largely where longer wheelbases, slacker angles and so forth have come from in the last few years. The reason for this is that with most vehicles, 
we would prefer to simply lower the center of mass. Now with the bike, we don't really have a huge amount of flexibility with that because the rider is only so tall and the rider is the dominant mass of the bike. So, you know, a typical rider might be 80 kilograms and they're on a 14 kilogram bike. So the rider is by far heavier than the bike in most cases. But the height of the rider has the single largest effect on the center of mass. We can raise or lower the bottom bracket a little bit, but obviously you lower it too far, you start smacking your pedals on the ground. So because we can't lower the center of mass easily, like people would typically do with a race car to reduce the amount of load shift that we get front to rear, what we have to do instead, if we wanna bring these angles in, is lengthen the wheelbase or lengthen the front center or the rear center. Changing just the front center, for example, by either slackening the head angle and bringing this front axle further out here, or by increasing the reach, uh, will obviously slacken this alpha angle, so our endo angle. Likewise, increasing just the rear center tends to increase uh, the looping angle. Now, it's interesting to note that the center of mass here, as I've drawn it, is just in one place. Obviously, the rider's center of mass shifts around. Unfortunately, when we're standing, it tends to be further forward than when we're sitting, which is kind of the opposite of what it would ideally be. Because when we're standing, that's usually an indicator that we're descending, so the bike is tipped up this way, and we want to be back a bit further. When we're climbing, conversely, we typically want the center of mass to be further forward, so that this beta angle is a bit slacker. Uh, slacker, shallower, however we want to describe that. Where bike companies, uh, or the more progressive bike company geometries, have gone in recent years is to use really steep seat tube angles because that obviously brings our center of mass further forward, makes this a shallower angle. Now this has the effect, if all else is left equal, that we shorten the distance from your hips to your handlebars. And so along with that has tended to come longer front centers. So we've made this angle, this beta angle shallower by st uh, steepening the seat tube angle and we have compensated in reach with the front center, which also helps with making this alpha angle, our endo angle, uh, shallower. And this has basically had the, equi had the equivalent effect of lowering the bike. So that's essentially what we are trying to do. It's the same thing that people do with Formula One cars. When they're trying to get that weight down low, it's these angles that they're trying to effectively reproduce. So in our first limit case scenario, we're looking at the front end only. So if you are on steep terrain, uh, you're constantly encountering impacts to the front wheel. What we then have is something that's trying to tip the front wheel, uh, trying to tip the bike over on the front wheel. And so this is where this alpha angle, our endo angle is quite critical. So our center of mass up here, obviously this, you know, the shallower this angle becomes, whether this center of mass becomes lower or becomes further back, then the more stable the bike becomes, the harder it becomes to tip over the front. That can be really confidence inspiring when you want to go charging through rough terrain or steep stuff. And so this is why downhill bikes have always been so much slacker and longer than cross country bikes, you know, historically. And we're now seeing uh, similar things with the enduro bikes and trail bikes and so forth. Likewise, our rear wheel uh, limit case is the same thing when we're climbing. So when you're climbing, the further forward you can bring the center of mass uh, relative to the rear contact patch, uh, the steeper an angle you're going to be able to climb before you loop out, hence why we've called it the looping angle. So that can be done obviously by increasing the length of the rear center, moving the whole bike forward of the rear axle, can be done by lowering the center of mass, handy if you are capable of getting shorter, or it can be done by increasing the seat tube angle, so steepening the seat tube angle, which essentially brings us forward. So those are the two front and rear limit cases uh, described. They are fairly simple for the most part. The much more difficult aspect to understand here uh, than either of the limit cases is the transient scenario where we're looking at how much weight we have on the front and rear wheels. Now, most you know, intermediate and advanced riders are quite well aware that you will have more grip from the front wheel if you have more weight on the front wheel. And so it becomes quite important that we keep enough weight on each wheel while we're cornering in particular, uh, that we have enough grip from it. So in a straight line, this is not so critical. You can move your body around, you know, it's more about those avoiding critical sort of front and rear limit scenarios and being able to work the bike in a way that's comfortable and predictable. 
But when we're cornering, tire load is everything. How much grip you can get out of your front wheel is especially critical. Is, as we're all aware, rear wheel sliding is not necessarily a big deal. Front wheel sliding, generally not a lot of fun. Okay guys, that about does us for this week uh, on geometry. So we're gonna go into some uh, number crunching of the rear center, front center relationship next week. It's gonna be uh, a little bit spreadsheet heavy, but uh, I trust you guys can get something useful out of it. Thanks for watching, see you next week.